Let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so first thing I want to talk about is Wednesday and the group projects and presentations that are coming up and the requirements for the projects and presentations. So I had sent out a uh, announcement earlier today and I want to kind of go over that. So as I've been telling the other groups um, <clears throat> that Wednesday's presentation, or Wednesday, Monday, depending on what time your, your team presents. If you can't finish everybody on Wednesday, we'll finish on Monday. But basically, this presentation is going to be about technical requirements. Okay, So I was kind of joking, but uh, in all seriousness, a friend of mine, uh, his daughter's into horses, and she does professional competitions, and, and one of the things that she does is something called dressage. And I don't know if you've seen dressage, but it's probably one of the most boring sports I've ever watched because I don't understand it. It's like the horse like walks over there and then they grade the horse and how it walks and then the horse stands and then they grade the horse on how it stands. It's kind of boring as opposed to the horse runs around and jumps over things. That's kind of cool, but that's not dressage. Okay. So dressage is extremely technical. Well, your group projects are going to be graded like dressage. So basically you're going to have 10 minutes on Wednesday, you're going to have four sections, and you're going to have a PowerPoint file. And everything has to be in that PowerPoint file and talked about. And if it's not, there will just be deductions. So what today is going to be about is making sure that you meet all the technical requirements for that presentation. When you do the second version of the presentation in a couple weeks, first week of December, you're going to have 15 minutes, not 10 minutes, and then you're going to have more flexibility to spend time on the things that are more important to your evaluation. So version one is just technically, did you get everything in there? Does it make sense? Does it add up? Or did you cover everything? Versus the second one, we can focus more on what's more relevant to the final valuation. So <clears throat> let's talk about Wednesday. So with that in mind, <clears throat> uh, you're going to turn in by 10 a.m. five files. All right. First, you're going to turn in the PowerPoint file with all the exhibits. And then you're going to turn in four Excel files. The as is, the bull, the bear, and the target. Okay, so those are the five files that all the teams have to turn in 10 a.m. Wednesday morning. Now, when you do your presentation, all of the exhibits, including data from those four Excel files, has to be put into the PowerPoint file. So as a point of potential confusion, last semester, the teams had to turn in both a paper, about 30 pages long, and they had to do the PowerPoint file. This semester, you're not doing a paper. You're just doing the PowerPoint file. But everything has to be put in the PowerPoint file, almost like a paper. So here's the deal. <clears throat> to not advantage teams that go later in the presentation <coughs> timeline. If you go first, and I'm deducting points, the other teams will see that. And then the other teams might realize they forgot to put that in, too. So by time they present, they'll be pulling out data to fill in the gaps. Well, to be fair, that's why it has to be in the PowerPoint file when you turn it in. Otherwise, I can't give you credit for it because otherwise it would disadvantage whoever goes first. So in order to kind of level the playing field, whatever you turn in at 10, by 10 a.m. as your PowerPoint is all that I will consider for a grade. So if you talk about something that's not there, I'm not giving you credit for it, and there will be a deduction. Okay, so you have to only talk about what's there, which means everything has to go into that PowerPoint file. And that's why I don't want to let you go to Excel, because if you go to Excel, then you can also, in a way, sneakily add stuff that you might have otherwise forgotten. So even your Excel files, you'll turn in, but if you want to talk about something in Excel, copy and paste to the PowerPoint, because that's all that you're going to be able to present out of for your presentation. So, yes, sir? Can we embed the link from Excel? You can, but I'm not going to let you click on it. So therefore, it doesn't really help you. So screenshots. Put in screenshots. Don't put in links. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, 10 minutes, two and a half minutes per section. There are four sections. All right? So you have to cover all four sections in 10 minutes. Now, each section is worth 2% of your semester grade, eight total points together. If you run out of time, and I will have my iPad and it'll be on a countdown timer, and I'll set it at 10 minutes, and when it hits zero and the alarm goes off, you're done. All right? So very important, budget your time so you cover all four sections. Because if you're on section three and you run out of time, regardless of what's in your PowerPoint, you're going to lose 2% for your semester grade for the whole team. 
So very important to make sure that you cover all four sections because all four sections are equally weighting to the grades. And so that's what I'm telling you, 10 minutes goes by very, very quickly. So I also will ch tell you it's up to you who you want to present. You can have one person present, you can have seven people present, right? But you still have 10 minutes and you still have to cover all of the sections. So it's very important that your team decide who's going to cover it because whoever covers it, the group grade is going to be based on who is presenting, but it's up to you to decide how you want to do it. Now I know for this one, the first morning of the presentation, some of you can't be here. That's okay. Although just make sure that your teammates know that you can't be here and they still feel that you contributed even though you weren't here because there are peer reviews associated with that. So make sure that doesn't occur as well. All right, so back to this. <clears throat> what are the four sections and what are the minimum screenshots? You can have more than the minimum, but these are the minimum I'm going to be looking for. Let's start out with the EIC section. Minimum of two screenshots. So if we were doing, and somebody was asking about Carnival, so I have their data up. If we were doing Carnival, then RV, markets, beta. This is one of the screenshots you'll have because it'll have the beta for Carnival and essentially an industry beta. Okay. So that is one of the screenshots for the E. So when you're talking about the economic sensitivity, then you're referring to the beta. This is very important for the presentation throughout. You must refer to numbers. So you can't just say Carnival is a little less sensitive to the industry and then move on because that will be a deduction for that section. You have to say Carnival's beta is 0.86, the industry's beta is 0.9, and therefore they're less sensitive to market changes than the average company of the industry. So again, throughout the presentation, make sure you're referring to numbers. For the I and the C, you're going to need, at a minimum, the spread. It'd be great to have the operating spread, but you at least need some spread to talk about industry attractiveness and to talk about competitive advantage. Okay, so those are the other two items you're going to have to talk about, and you'll need the spread to talk about that. So that's EIC. And again, you'll have two and a half minutes to cover that, including talking about five forces. So particularly when you talk about five forces, industry analysis about how it affects spreads, you got to be short and to the point, right? Because you can't spend four minutes talking about the five forces. It'll just kill your entire presentation grade, right? Second section, historical analysis. You will need to do a five-year ROIC tree for the industry, and this is what I'm going to call a super tree in just a second, and you'll have to do a five-year CFI. Okay, So let's talk about the CFI for a second. For the CFI, again, if I go back to we did Under Armour, you will need... <coughs> five-year CFI with reinvestment rate and walk through that. Again, referring to numbers. For the super tree, I uploaded a file to Elms. You can find it in the file section under a file called supertree.xlsx. And here's the difference. The ROIC tree you have to go through. So let's go back to a model. So here was the ROIC tree for Under Armour as an example. So you have to walk through the ROIC tree for your company. But what I also want you to do is add five more companies' trees to what I call a super tree. So instead of just having your company's ROIC, you'll have five additional peers ROIC. And so literally you're just going to copy and paste the trees to this file and aggregate them. Then you're just going to do a straight industry average. Okay. And there's a page one and a page two, just because otherwise it gets too small to see, but basically two pages of the tree. You're just going to cut and paste to fill these out. Right. Rationale. <clears throat> My company's ROIC is going up and down. I want to know if the industry ROIC is also going up and down. 
because maybe I'm going up and everybody else is going up, so it's an industry trend. Or maybe I'm going up and my peers are not, so it's something that happens to do with my competitive advantage or is generic to just me or germane to just me. So that's the point. The super tree gives me a sense of how I'm performing against my industry and whether or not I'm going with the industry or going in a different direction in the industry. So it gives me some additional insight. So here's the thing. To create the super tree, your model creates it by default. Every time you put data into the model, it creates it by default. You don't have to do five more valuations, okay? Because here's the point. If you just take the data that you can export and just put the data into the model, into the, go back to Microsoft, this model data tab, the second you enter the model data tab and update this, it updates and creates a tree for that company. <coughs> so basically, do the valuation for your company, for five other companies, then just put the data, export it, put in this tab, create the tree, copy and paste five more times. Create the industry super tree. Okay. So again, you don't have to do six different valuations, just to be clear on that. You don't have to finish out the EEO. You don't have to put in the WAC and the others for the non-company that you're valuing. The tree is independent of that. Questions about the super tree or section two. Section three, multiples. At a minimum, so make sure the super tree, make sure the CFI is part of your PowerPoint file. Multiples, make sure that you have the RV multiples screen. Option one, you could give me this screenshot. Option two, you could export this to Excel, which you've copied into your model, and you can put the Excel screenshot. But either way, this needs to be in there. All right? And when you go through and do the multiple section, three companies, just as we've done in previous examples, your companies, two others. So you don't have to go through the entire list. You can pick two. Matter of fact, pick two that are easier to explain. Maybe find somebody that's a premium to you and find somebody that's a discount and explain that. But the point is you got to go through three companies talking about estimated margin, lowest to highest or highest to lowest, and talking about expected ROIC, lowest to highest or highest to lowest amongst those three. All right. So again, you'll still have a much bigger list of peers, and you'll just pick three off this list, yours plus two others, to explain. Now, very important, somebody had asked about this last class, you, even though you have multiples, you have to have at least six peers in your multiple assessment. So, for example, when the Carnival group was asking me about this, by default, Carnival doesn't have a lot of peers. In fact, they have two. So, this list is not long enough to do a true representation of the industry and to do the exercise that I want you to do. So, if you think about it, a cruise ship is like a mobile floating hotel. So if you go here to the global industry classification, then essentially you're going to be adding a lot of hotels and travel companies to the list. right? So you need to have at least six. Now for the super tree, you have exactly six. For the RV, for both the EIC and the multiples, you'll have more than six, and that's okay. Right? I just arbitrarily pick six in the super tree because I don't want you to put 18 different companies and have some gigantic mega tree. It's just too much data, take too much time. All right, so I would say pick the six biggest, most relevant companies to your company for the super tree, but you'll still have a bigger list of at least six. In this case, they would have 18 for the carnival peers. Okay, that's multiples. <coughs> Section four, the valuation. I would suggest six screenshots for this section. Screenshot number one, six PowerPoint slides. PowerPoint slide number one. Take the relevant data from the ratios and the assumptions. Particularly, take the growth, the EBITDA, the tax rate, and the G and the WAC. Those are probably your most important assumptions. Put that onto a PowerPoint slide. Here's my as is. So the whole idea is, on this slide, 
to get the as is, I use these assumptions. I use these ratios. All right, here's why. Then, bull. PowerPoint slide number two. Copy and paste. Change the ratios. Change the assumptions. Here's my bull. Here's why I changed it to the high end. This is my ceiling. Slide number three. Bear. Here's my ratios, here's my assumptions, here's my floor. Slide number four. Here's where I come up on the ratios and assumptions, here's my target, here's where I fall in the range, buy, sell, hold. And then finally, sanity check number one, ROIC chart, sanity check number two, implied multiples. Okay, that's your valuation section. Again, two and a half minutes. So I've probably been talking for 13, and you have 10 to do the whole thing. So as I said, be efficient, right? One thing you don't want to waste time on, don't waste time on explaining process. I know the process. I know you now know the process. So don't say, well, I went to Bloomberg, and I copied the data, and I pasted the data, and I averaged the data, because all you did is waste 10 seconds. And those are precious seconds that don't help your grade. So focus more on numbers, results, context, right? Because that's what's key. Help me understand why you chose a number. Help me understand the numbers that you changed that matter and then what it means to the results. And then cover the basics of what I told you. Then you'll do fine on Wednesday, right? If you don't do fine, you'll get deductions and then you'll find out what they are and then you can basically improve before you get presentation number two in two weeks, which is worth 17% of your semester grade. So the dry run, it's 8%, two weeks, 17%, and you'll have more time, okay? If you ace Wednesday and everything goes well, you probably don't have to make too many changes for the final one in two weeks, right? But the, it'll be your chance to improve, right? And <clears throat> a couple other miscellaneous comments that I'll make based on past experience with these presentations. Often teams will put these together at the last minute because they'll break them out and they'll assign it to different parts of the team. Just be very careful to manage the time because what will often happen is somebody will be presenting, they're not familiar with the other sections, they'll have the timing wrong, and like I said, if you screw up the timing, no matter what's in your PowerPoint, you'll get deductions. So make sure you manage the time across all four sections. So very related to this, don't contradict yourselves because you didn't talk to each other. So, for example, you don't want somebody in the EIC saying this is a horrible, terrible industry that's shrinking and nobody's making money, and then you got strong buy, strong buy, growth off the charts, amazing ROICs in the valuation section. Because, yes, just as you're laughing now, you'll see me laughing, but it'll be bad for your grade. So I, I don't want to see that happen to you, so I'm just saying talk to each other, sync your presentation together. You should have kind of a red thread pulling all the way through and it should be consistent across what you're saying in the sections. Matter of fact, the section should help you do the valuation. So for the team that's working on the valuation or the part of the team, then they should be talking to the other parts to help them with their valuation assumptions. All right, questions about anything? Yes? Mm -hmm. No. For purposes of Wednesday, I'll assume that you selected them for reasons that are relevant. Okay. Good question. Other questions? All right. Dress code, by the way, for Wednesday and potentially Monday, just as you are now. It's fine. You don't have to get dressed up. I'm going to grade you more on what you say than how you look. Right. <clears throat> now, don't come in like shorts and you know flip-flops, but other than that, it'll be cold. All right. <clears throat> so, Today we're going to talk about Microsoft and the as-is valuation of Microsoft that we did to get some additional lessons learned. And <clears throat> one of the things that I want to talk about with Microsoft is how do we come up with, in the as-is, an appropriate G? Because right? I think that's something that we all will struggle with in any valuation that we do. What is a a terminal value G that is appropriate to any valuation. So here's where I want to remind us of some material in the book relative to the valuation and the multiple section. So if we go back and we look at 
and this was in lecture six, it was covered in the video, and it was in the readings on multiples, then this is the equation that McKinsey gave us for enterprise value to EBIT. Right? It took the key value driver equation and rearranged it to the enterprise value to EBIT equation. Right? And what it really says is what drives enterprise value to EBIT are four major things. Tax rate, G, terminal value G, expected ROIC, CV ROIC, and the WAC. Those are the things that will drive enterprise value to EBIT. Okay? That's just math. So here's the point. I have to come up with a valuation for Microsoft. I have to come up with a revenue growth rate, primarily an EBITDA, and essentially a tax rate. I can change the other values as well, but I need to get to an as-is valuation. And then i got to come up with a reasonable G. Well, here's the thing. Based on Microsoft's EV to sales and EV to EBIT, we already know what their EBIT margin, operating income margin, needs to be in perpetuity. Okay, <coughs> approximately. So we get that from the multiples. So in the ratios for EBITDA, we should have come up with a number around 38.2 in 2022 to get to about a 30.4 operating margin. So that's one of the ways the multiple section helps us with our as-is valuation. Okay? Hopefully everybody did that and you used an EBITDA margin somewhere around 38.2 in 2022 based on the trading multiples. Might have varied slightly depending on when you did the exercise, but this is as of this weekend. So it had been before, close of, uh, before opening of trading today. That was the EV to sales and EV to EBIT. Okay? Now, here's the next thing I want to do. Is using this formula, so I went over here in the assumptions tab and make it a little bit bigger. These are the elements of this formula for EV to EBIT. Okay? So here's the point. We will need a no pat or no plat. Okay. <clears throat> Which means we're eventually going to need an EBIT and a WAC. So in the actual formula, EBIT, I'm uh, sorry, and tax rate. EBIT tax rate. So EBIT tax rate. We're going to need a WAC. We're going to need an ROIC and continuing value. And we're going to need a G to basically get an enterprise value to EBIT. Okay? Everybody with me on that? So here's the point. I don't really need the no plat. I need in the original continuing value equation. But this, if we're using the second forward year, enterprise value to EBIT, which this morning was 13.01. Okay? So right now, for Microsoft, it's probably changed due to the trading range. But if I go here to the multiples, Today, Microsoft finished, based on their closing stock price, down about a dollar. Uh, their EV to EBIT is 12.87, right? So before their stock price went down up 92 cents today, it started out the day at about 13.01. Okay, so I'm just going to use the 13.01, but basically that's the observed second year 2018 EV to EBIT for Microsoft. So here's the point. What drives these numbers are the, really the perpetuity assumptions. So here is the G in perpetuity. I'm going to start that out at zero. Because what I want to do is I want to use this formula to help me estimate a G in my model. Okay. Next, I have my ROIC. This is the continuing value ROIC. That was this number, which is the 2022 expected ROIC. This is the continuing value WAC. We always use one, one WAC and a DCF. So this was the WAC of Microsoft. And the tax rate. What I did for the tax rate is I used an average of the last six years to come up with 22.5%. Now, this is where we can vary this because there is an argument as Microsoft is becoming more global that the 15.7 might be more realistic for them going forward or there's an argument that they could pay 22. 
right? And this is what I mean by your assumptions. So you have to state very clearly, I'm using a 22% tax rate because I think that the average of the six years is most reasonable. Or I'm using something closer to 16 because I think last year is more indicative of the trend of the tax rate they're going to be paying than the average of the six years, right? But nonetheless, you got to come up with your reasonable tax rate. Right now, this is an average of the six years. So all this data already exists in the model. I just put it in one place so you could visualize this, okay? So here's the point. We have a formula for enterprise value to EBIT right here. So what I did is I took this formula and I basically put it into this cell. Okay, so let me do this again. Let me wipe this out so you can see it. So equals, find the formula, one minus the tax rate. So one minus the tax rate times one minus the growth over the ROIC And then you take all of that and you divide by WAC minus G. So here's the point. Given these assumptions, at no growth, no long-term G, Microsoft would trade at 8.24 times EBIT. Today, Microsoft started the day at 13. Is Microsoft expected to grow? Is G positive? Yeah, because they have a positive spread. So therefore, it would have to be positive to get to a higher EV to EBIT. So that's the point. I can back into the G. All right, so 2%, 3%, 4%, so somewhere between 3 and 4, 3 and a half. So the trading multiples gave me two pieces of information. Piece of information number one, that this is the approximate estimated margin of Microsoft. 30.4 of EBIT. Information point number two, based on their trading multiple today for EV to EBIT and based on our knowledge of the formulas that lead to an EV to EBIT, growth rate is somewhere around 3.6%. So there's my G. So before I just randomly say G's 4%, 5%, 2%, cuz that's pretty much what it is, it's kind of a random guess. I'm not saying we can't randomly guess cuz we are predicting the future, but I at least get a more refined guess based on the trading multiples and based our, on our understanding of DCF and the cash flows. So therefore this, based on the trading range, is probably where the G is close to, 3.6. Questions about what I just did? The EBIT is the 2018 EBIT off of the income tab, because it's the forward year two. Right? Yes? Is that the same with the NOPAT? The NOPAT is the 2018 NOPAT off of the TII. Right there. Because again, I'm doing forward year two multiple in the real world, forward year two in my model. And we've already sunk them up because we're using off the EEO the next two forward years off the analyst estimates. So they're already sunk up in the model. But let me show you something interesting. If we go back to what I just did and I make the EBIT a dollar, notice the multiple doesn't change. Because what really drives the multiple? <clears throat> Tax rate, WAC, ROIC, G. It's just like the key value drivers, because it's the key value driver rearranged. So it's not the size, it's the quality. And this is what's going to drive the quality, therefore the multiple you pay. So that's the point. I can estimate a multiple, and it gives me a sense of what the key value drivers are in perpetuity. Now, this file with these equations was uploaded to the file section in a folder 
called Microsoft, Microsoft model as is in class. That's the actual file that I just showed you now. I done in a previous section and it's already there. So you're welcome to do this. You don't have to recreate what I just did. You're also welcome to recreate it as I just did. Right? Questions about and what I just did. So let me show you a nuance though that's slightly different. Yes. So is that like a sanity check that you want us to talk about in our presentation? I call it a, a sort of a sanity check. So one of the things that you guys have to do is you have to come up with a reasonable G. And what I'm telling you is here's a way that will help you get a starting point for a G. So it will help you when you do your as is. Now this doesn't have to be your final G because obviously your final G will be your opinion of what their growth is, but at least it gets you in the ballpark. And that's what I'm saying. If you're starting the Microsoft model, do I use two, three, four, five, six? What do I use? And, and I could say, all right, I'll default to three, but why am I defaulting to three? I just think they're going to grow at the economy. Well, the market right now might be using a growth rate higher than G because Microsoft is in growth mode again. So this is what we can kind of discern based on the multiples. This is how I talk about the sections overlap. So the multiples are giving us two data points. The multiples are giving us a data point on margin, and the multiples are giving us a data point on G. Right? So here's two nuances. You know what the, the multiples can also give us is if, back to here, what if I actually believe the tax rate for Microsoft should be, uh, was it 15 point something? It's called 16%. Well, guess what? If I thought Microsoft's tax rate should be closer to 16%, which was the 15.7 last year, then my G should be closer to 3.1. So here's the thing. To some degree, it's assumption-based, right? Because if my assumption is a lower tax rate, then I'm probably going to have a lower G. If my assumption is a higher tax rate, I'm probably going to have a higher G. And those are two potential scenarios, and it could be somewhere between the two. So what I'm telling you is it's not that there's necessarily an exact correct answer, because we are aggregating several fields to get to one number. right? And in a way, it's, it's a multi-variable equation that we're solving for, which makes it a little bit more difficult. But nonetheless, <clears throat> it gives us a sense of range, and this is what I mean by articulating your assumption. So if I use this assumption, then I would say Microsoft G is 3.1% because I'm assuming their tax rate is 16. If I said I think Microsoft's tax rate is 22.5%, then their G is 3.6. Right? I don't have to do both, but helping me understand how you tied those assumptions helps me understand how you got to the G. Right? Or another variation. Let me go back. If I have a sense of the G, I can solve for an ROIC. So let's say I don't know what the company's ROIC is going to be in the future. But I have a sense of how fast I think they're going to grow. I can put in a G, and then I can adjust the ROIC to what I think the expected ROIC is going to be if I think the company has a different ROIC in the future than they have in the past. So again, it's using the key value drivers in perpetuity not necessarily to be right, because this is, I think, where teams run into trouble, right? Which is your bias gets in the way of your ability to do this exercise, which is why I'm making you do the as is, right? So in just a minute, I'm going to pick on a team, right? And, and I'm going to do it as a learning opportunity. It's not fair to the team, but that's okay. But it's a great learning opportunity where the team, in this case, was basically trying to figure out why a company with a historical negative spread couldn't actually justify in their as-is the stock price, because in order for the stock price to actually work, the spread had to flip to be positive. But none of the data the team seen historically had a positive spread. It was all negative. And even with the first couple of years of neg analyst estimates, it was still negative. And I think where the team gets hung up, and this happens again, so this is not just that team. Other people struggle with this, which is why I'm using this as an example. 
problem is you start to think, okay, well, the company can't possibly have a negative spread, so then you start making wacky assumptions, right, which don't make any sense in order to justify the current stock price, or you throw your hands up and say, model's broken, or the company's stock price is broken, it's not explainable. But the reality is, what the market is actually assuming is a big positive spread. They have to, in order to justify the stock price. And I'll, and I'll give you this example now. So the team is higher. They're in this room. And this is their as-is that they sent to me over the weekend. Okay? And this is the challenge that they had, which is stock price for Hyatt, I assume sometime in the last few days, was around 53. And they did an as-is of 11. Obviously, that's a big gap for an as-is. Right? We need to get within a dollar. And I think their frustration was, and you see it here, that given these ratios and the ratios they used, and you can see it right here, or they basically took the revenue growth rate that the analysts had starting in year two. They just ran them out, 4%. Okay? And again, single digits looks reasonable. And they took a margin, which was a little bit worse than what it was in the analyst two years. They just did based on the last historical year, and they ran that out. And they did an average tax rate, which was actually lower than the last year tax rate. And they put in a G, a 4%. They did all that, and they came up with a stock price of $11 a share. Right? And here's the thing. If I go back to my G, and I crank this to 6%, guess what? The share price actually goes negative. Why? Yeah. Because they got a negative spread. Because in the year that matters most in this model is the final T plus 1 year, and the T plus 1 year, their ROIC was 6%, and the WAC was 8.7. So the more you grow, the more value you destroy, and the worse your stock price gets. Well, I can't then have negative growth. So I can put negative growth in. <coughs> so I could make this negative 5%. Negative 5%. And I can start getting a higher stock price. But then I have to think about Hyatt, and I'm, I'm seeing observable data, and this is what I mean by this doesn't make sense, because here's a company that's growing at 4% a year, and suddenly they're going to shrink 5% in perpetuity, and they're going to go away. Well, that doesn't make sense as well. So this is what I mean by you have to start putting crazy numbers in to start justifying your valuation. Obviously, you get very frustrated. So what's the right answer? What has to happen? Deceleration growth rate. Potentially deceleration growth rate, but... <coughs> Realistically, you're probably not going to see a hotel chain go to zero. And I'll give you another reason. Because if you look at the multiples for Hyatt, they actually have the highest long-term growth rate in the industry over the next five years. So I don't think it's that. But that was a good guess. So what else? What has to happen at Hyatt? I'm sorry? Well, they could change the cost of capital, but we're really not trying to mess around with the wax in this class. But the margins have to lead to a positive spread. What we have to do is we have to have a positive spread. And let me show this to you in a different way. What you should realize at this point in the semester is that this very complicated spreadsheet is just a big NPV. And that's all the DCF valuations. It's just a big NPV. And here's the key to the big NPV. It's right here. We're just adding up six numbers to come up with the value of the firm, primarily. Five years of free cash flow discounted, and then a continuing value period. And what they're really saying is the value of the company is about five times the current value they're estimating, which means this value for operating value probably needs to be more like eight or nine billion than 600 million. And I'm telling you, you don't get to eight or nine billion with a negative spread. You just can't. Cash flows don't make any sense. Yet that's actually the value of Hyatt today. So this is what I mean by it starts getting into your bias in the way of the as is valuation, because the bias is we've had a negative spread, the company has a negative spread going forward, they can't possibly be worth this with a negative spread. Well, what I'm telling you is if you take that out of the equation, the only way you can get to a $60 share price, or whatever it is, $50-something share price, is if the, the spread flips to positive. 
It's got to, because that's the only way that number gets big enough. So how do we change the spread to positive in our model? Because I'm not having you change this number directly. So what changes that number? It's the ratios in this year. So something has to change about the growth rate and or the margin and or the tax rate and or the rest of the balance sheet, if you want to change those ratios too, that turns the spread positive. That's the key to making the high evaluation work. Because if you don't change the continuing value assumptions to make that ROIC positive, there's no way you can justify the current share price of Hyatt. And what I'm telling you is based on the actual trading data of Hyatt, regardless of the past, the market is pricing them as if the spread goes positive in the future. And that's the only way that you get close to their valuation. Yeah. Okay. So let me give you another hint. How positive does it have to be? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go to the Assumptions tab for Hyatt, and I'm going to go to the Microsoft that I just showed you. Okay? And I just gave you these fields for estimating the enterprise value to EBIT multiple. Okay? So here's what you can do with your own models. Just select these fields that I just added, right-click, copy, go back to the Hyatt model, and as long as you do this cell for cell, so it starts at cell D11 on the Assumptions tab, right-click, paste special formulas. Now you just put the formulas in that are already mapped to the same formulas in this spreadsheet. So I just replaced it with the highest values. Again, I'll make it bigger on the zoom so it's easier to see. And I'll do a little bit of formatting. So here is percentage, 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 and here. So here's the thing. This is my observed What is it? Enterprise value to EBIT at the time was 22.29. So what I want is I want this number to be 22.29. The problem with the negative spread in the model and the continuing value is I'm at 6. So what do I need to change here? I can't just change the G. If I change the G, it gets worse because they have a negative spread. So I have to do a positive spread. So let me go back. <clears throat> they started with four. I'll put in four. All right. ROIC, eight, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 50, even if I crank up the ROIC to 50%, I don't get to 22 times EV to EBIT because I don't have enough growth. I'm almost like a bond. So it's a combination of growth and spread. Now, I don't think Hyatt's getting to 50% ROIC anytime soon because they've been about mid-single digits historically. That's what the team had noticed. So let's say in a best-case scenario they get to mid-teens, 15%. Well... That's what the team needs to get to. That the team is right that the G has to be bigger. But the problem is it's got to be bigger at a positive spread. Now, I know this isn't exact because you can argue maybe it's 13% WAC and a higher G, or 13% ROIC and a higher G, or maybe it's 16% and a lower G, <coughs> and you can come up with assumptions. But I'm telling you, this gets me to a share price 
that is indicative of how high it is being priced in the market today. And is somewhat consistent with the multiples where Hyatt is considered to be the fastest growing hotel chain of this list of peer groups. So it does suggest that they are growing faster and they're getting a lot of credit. But it also says that how much do I have to make the spread positive to jump to the current share price? Now here's again where bias comes in the way because as the team I could say, you know what? I don't think that they can get to a 15% ROIC. Well, guess what? You're going to be arguing for a sell recommendation on Wednesday, right? But again, the point is they're really trading at $51 a share, and we have to come up with a cash flow that does that. And the only way the cash flow does that, you can see this on the DCF valuation, is now I have a continuing value that's much higher, so it's around $4 billion, $3.5 billion which essentially gets me, well, sorry, I didn't change my share price in the model. Then I have to change my model prices because $3.5 billion doesn't get me there. So then what the team would have to do is they have to come to the ratios and adjust the ratios in 2021 to get closer to a 15% ROIC in the model, which would then get me closer to the share price. All right. So this is also why I thought the multiples could be helpful because when you do run into trouble like this, the multiples not only are a sanity check, but the multiples can kind of help you back into reasonable assumptions, which is the whole point of the as is. And as we said, it's not about whether I agree with the price. The price is the price. What I have to do is I have to justify the price on a cash flow basis. And using the formulas in the class, this is one of the ways that I would have to do it. Questions about any of this? Yes? So the, uh, the operating income margin is 7.5% so you're going to have to either change the EBITDA higher, so you could change this to be higher, and to some degree that, or, and this is where I mentioned these other factors, you could start ramping down some of the percentages of the balance sheet and basically say Hyatt is not going to be spending as much on their hotels in another way of saying they're going to get better prices for their hotels rather than opening up more hotel rooms. So you could actually start changing the productivity. So maybe in the Hyatt's team case, it really is more of a productivity play. It could also be an even lower tax rate. And what I mean by that is REITs are pretty popular. And maybe Hyatt is considering going into becoming a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust, because they are tax advantaged. So maybe that I could actually play around with the tax rate if I read somewhere in the analyst that they're talking about becoming a REIT. So, but what I'm telling you is now the problem becomes a little bit more solvable. I'm not saying it's easy, but and I'm also saying that, and I don't want to speak for the team because you actually have to do this as an assignment, but <clears throat> as a team, then you could go into your target or even your bull and your bear, and you can say, you know what, I find this to be hard for them to achieve. So that's why I said your bias might end up being towards a sell. But we still have to come up with some way of justifying the cash flows to get closer to this. And at least I get a range of growth in ROIC. So maybe make the ROIC a little lower, crank the growth even higher. right? Because that could be the other part of this, is that maybe it is even higher growth. You know, put 12% and maybe it's 8%. You can play around on the model. But it's a start, but this is what I wanted to show you. All right, other questions. This can help all the other teams too, because you guys all have to justify your Gs. So this is another way to help you get more insight into what the G should be. So you get the G, you can get the even margin. Yeah? How do we, like, say, argue that productivity would increase and the consensus out there would say that they're spiking the decrease in productivity? <clears throat> if that was the case, if the productivity is going to get worse, then you'd have to come up with some other explanation. But I don't know if, if for Hyatt Hotels in particular that the consensus is saying decreased productivity. No, there's like hypothetical. Oh. Like I to be <clears throat> well, that's where you'd have to. So, I'll give you another example. Somebody in this room is Marriott, and they were asking me about the multiples for Marriott. So, here's the deal one of the things that's happening in the hotel industry is that Marriott and others, like Four Seasons, as an example, <clears throat> do you know what is the most expensive hotel in the world? The most valuable hotel in the world. Does anybody know? Marriott. It's actually the Four Seasons New York. 
Average room rate, $900 a night. The property is worth well over a billion dollars. Okay? So the property owners are actually thinking about putting the building on the market and selling it, cashing in. Top peak real estate, cash in, make a lot of money because the, the property is full, it's got great margins, and it's in a great location. But here's the thing. The Four Seasons, it's a Four Seasons hotel, but they manage the hotel. They don't own the building. Somebody else owns the building. So one of the things that Four Seasons has done is they make a lot of money, and Marriott does the same thing, is that they don't actually own a lot of their properties. They manage the properties. They put their brand on the property, but they let somebody else own the real estate. Because historically, outside of the Four Seasons of New York, a lot of these real estate properties, particularly after the 2007 financial crisis, didn't do so well. So what some of the hotel operators are doing is some hotels are saying, we don't actually want to own the hotels. We want somebody else to take that hotel risk. So let's go back. Maybe that's one of the things Hyatt is doing. I mean, I don't know, but maybe Hyatt is saying, you know what, we want to be more like Marriott. So we're going to open up more hotels, but we'll let somebody else actually pay for the hotel and we'll put our brand on it. We'll put our people in front of it. We'll put you in our reservation system, but we're not going to actually build more hotels. We'll let somebody else pay for the actual hotel because that's the IC in the capital. And that's one of the reasons why Marriott has historically overperformed the rest of the industry because Marriott doesn't own nearly as many of their hotels because they've recognized that it's very expensive to do so. In fact, there's one of the other companies, Choice or um, Wyndham, it's one of those companies who has an extraordinarily high ROIC compared to their peers. You guys did your analysis. Who, was, who am I talking about? Is it Choice? is choice. Because same thing, choice is more of an operator of hotels and a brand than an owner of the brands. They own less real estate. By definition, they're getting higher ROICs as managers. They don't get the upside if the real estate goes crazy, but they also don't have the downside if the real estate collapses. So again, you could make an argument that maybe, and I haven't read the analyst reports, but this is where getting information about the company could help. Maybe that's what's going on with Hyatt. I don't know. But if Hyatt says, I'm going into the, we're going to own a bunch of hotel business, first, I'd be skeptical. But secondly, it would be inconsistent with what the share price is. So you probably have to have a story that explains the share price. But at least this is the way the math is going to work. All right, so let's come back to Microsoft. So as we did Microsoft, <coughs> I got share price, like I said, within a dollar for the as is. Sanity check. Sanity check number one, I need an ROIC chart. Somebody pointed out in the last class, it seems like every ROIC chart we've done this semester is a hockey stick. So he's starting to say hockey sticks don't seem like the exception, they seem like the rule. And it just so happened to be that we picked another growing company. And Microsoft is now a growing company. And you can clearly see that in the EEO for Microsoft. Go back to Microsoft, MSFT. And what you see is Microsoft's growth rate, I'll switch to growth, went from shrinking to 2% to 6% to 8% to almost 10%. By 2020, Microsoft is growing almost as fast as Google. And Microsoft has not been growing recently. What's changing? It's not acquisitions. Yeah. It's the cloud. And you can see that looking at their FA. If you look at the segments, even through June of this year, and you go by segment, what you see, productivity and business process, this is like exchange and office, right? So that's flat to slight decline. Then you have home personal computing, Windows. That is now in decline. The one area of Microsoft's business that is growing is what they call the intelligent cloud. Azure is their brand name. That is the growth area. And look what happens. $6 billion of operating profit on $41 billion worth of revenue. $9 billion of operating profit on 25 billion of revenue. The cloud is far more profitable 
than the PC. Right? I'm not saying Windows uh, 10, I'm not saying isn't helping them. I'm not saying that their little, whatever is it called, the Microsoft computers? What are they called? The Surface. I'm not saying that that's not helping them. I'm not saying the Xbox isn't helping them, but the margins on that are low. And it's a much tougher business because PCs in general have become much more commoditized than the cloud. And so this is what's changed, is that Balmer, who was replaced two years ago by this guy named Nadia, was basically the defender of his buddy, who founded one of the best companies ever, financially, he was the defender of the PC. And Nadia, the first thing he said is, the PC is not, it's a dying market. It's, it's now hit the end of our life cycle. And we are the PC company, but we're not making margins on the PC. we got to go to the cloud. The cloud is growing at 30% a year, has 30% margins, has a $36 billion business. And so what Nadia did is he said, we're focused more in the cloud. This year, Microsoft has surpassed cloud-based revenue bigger than Windows-based revenue, if you actually look at the segment. And next year, their cloud is expected to grow even more. That's the increasing growth rate for Microsoft. And it's much higher profitable business. What's sad for Microsoft is they're late to the party. Who is the number one cloud-based provider in the world? Amazon. Amazon. Amazon Web Services, AWS. They represent 40% of global internet traffic outside of China in the world today. So if you're surfing the internet, odds are it's an Amazon cloud property. They're just selling the online hosting for that. Who is their number one customer at Amazon, which is 20% of internet traffic right now? One-fifth of all internet traffic right now is one company on Amazon's cloud. It's Netflix. Next time you're streaming Netflix, you're actually streaming Amazon. Netflix just private labels it out. In fact, Amazon Prime has Amazon Prime Video. Amazon's like, hey, if we're going to do Netflix, we might as well do our own videos. But that's the point. Amazon is the cloud leader. Distant second, you got your Googles, you got your Microsoft, you got your IBM Watsons. They're all playing catch up. Amazon is the dominant cloud provider. But that's the point. Up until two years ago, Microsoft wasn't even trying to push the cloud that strong because they was a threat to the PC. The big difference is Nadia, their CEO, said, look, if we're thinking about the future, we got to be in the cloud and we can't worry about cannibalizing the PCs. And it was literally tough for them because they literally saw their Windows business go down. And that's the, the DNA of the company. But the flip side is they're now in the fast-growing markets, and that's why Microsoft has actually eclipsed its all-time market cap this year versus a decade ago because they were almost like a bond. <clears throat> and now they're a growth company again because they reoriented themselves into the cloud. And that's where you're seeing their stock price has started to reflect this because if you actually look at the stock price over the last five years, this is Nadia. Right? They went from 40 to almost 60. That's a 50% improvement in their market cap. And Microsoft's market cap today is $456 billion. They're catching up with Apple and Google. Right? And it's because they're now being relevant in the technologies of tomorrow. So I only say that because this is the price. Now, when you do your buy, sell, hold, and your bull and the bear, is our, that already priced it? Right? Because that becomes the next part of the conversation when you do the next part of your evaluation. So, again, they're doing great, but is the price already there, so I don't really have any upside? Or is there even more room to go? That would be what you'd be talking about in your, essentially, your analysis for your target. But when you do the as-is, these would be the assumptions as a baseline, plus or minus a little bit, to get there. And that's what this assignment was about. Questions? So, uh, we're going to end class a couple minutes early. Uh, two things. One, I'm around to answer any questions. And two, give you time to talk to your groups to sync up before you get ready for your presentations, which will start on Wednesday. Okay? So, good luck. <laughs>